All right, what's going on people? Welcome back to the channel. My name is Anas. I'm a junior doctor working in the UK. And in today's video, I thought, because so many of you guys are about to have exams. I mean, we're in December, so we're entering into crunch time, January. And since I have a whole load of, uh, you can say like a century of exam, <laughs> or a few years of exam experience, I thought I would bring you a collection of critical and crucial notice the alliteration there, tips, uh, really that helped me kind of uh, have that hunger and the, uh, and the, uh, the drive and also the focus to really kind of get through my work and study during that kind of important period before the exam. So say like the month before exam. And this really is an extension of the other video that I made a while back and haven't talked much about studying since then about flow. Okay, so some of these tips I didn't actually mention in that video. Some of them are just kind of a, a follow up really. Yeah, so I hope you're gonna find this useful and valuable. So we'll get into those. They are really a collection of four tips. So we'll get through them. Each one's very, very important. Each one I use myself, all right? So, and the number one tip is to know exactly what you're doing. You know, those three, four, five weeks before the exams are so important. A person needs to be very, very meticulous with how they spend that very limited time period or that, I mean, time is a resource really. And so we get into the mistake that some people make. And the mistake really is that they just tell themselves that they need to do some work or that they need to revise. So you get up in the morning and you say, okay, today I need to study. I know I need to study. I've got this exam in four weeks. And so you're just like saying that to yourself for the rest of the day. And you're just sitting on your desk and you're saying, I need to study. And you're opening random books and random lectures and doing random questions, whatever, without really knowing what you're actually doing without having a strategy in place. I mean, we tell ourselves we need to revise, we need to study, but what exactly are we studying? What exactly do we need to do? Or say, for example, I'm in my yard, I'm in my house, and I need to get to the coffee shop. Now, in order to the coffee shop, I need to know the route to the coffee shop. If I don't know the way there, then how am I supposed to get there? And that's very similar to a person who says, I need to study for my exam, and the end goal is the exam, but then they have no real strategy, they have no real route of getting there. And so if I'm going to that coffee shop, I don't know the way, then I'm just walking around aimlessly, taking a right, taking a left, and then hoping that I'll get there by some teleportation thing. And it doesn't work like that. Without having a direction to the end goal, then there is no progress happening at all. So before getting up from bed each day or taking my seat on the desk or starting work, I had a fairly clear idea of what I was trying to accomplish or specifically like what I was gonna do during that session. Am I gonna try to do 200 cardiology questions? Or am I gonna try go through all the uh, lectures on leukemias and lymphomas or whatever? Or was I going to try and practice two or three OSCE stations with some other colleagues or friends? And trust me, I'm not really a massive or like meticulous planner. So yeah, take it from me, make sure you have a strategy in place, at least some idea of what you're gonna do during that session and what you're trying to accomplish. Point number two is about measurement of progress. This one's one of the most, actually they're all really important, so I don't know what I'm trying to say here, but it's very, very important. I used to be very, very particular with making sure that every day that passed, there was some progress made or there was some kind of improvement. Because if there wasn't an improvement from day one to day two to day three, then clearly there is something wrong and whatever I'm doing is not working. And if what I'm doing is not working, then the time I'm putting in is a waste of time. And overall, there are two reasons why measuring progress is important. Number one, you're checking whether it's working. And number two, it actually makes things much more fun because you know, when you're trying something and then it actually works, then you wanna do more of it because then it's gonna work more. And then it just becomes this feedback loop. It becomes a bit like a game. And yeah, I mean, that's the reason why everyone likes FIFA or COD or playing games online or whatever. It's because there's some progress happening. You're trying to win, etc. So yeah, it makes it more like a game. This is also something that people make a mistake in. Oftentimes what they do is that people tell them, use this study technique or revise in this routine, or they decide on some routine themselves and then they don't actually check 
whether that routine or that study technique is working for them. And a good example of this is flashcards. I know we've heard a million times, thousands of times that active recall is probably the most efficient and the fastest way of memorizing information. Yeah, we can all agree on that. But then I think that's a simplistic way of looking at it because there are different ways that you can apply active recall. So for example, if you're using digital flashcards or Anki flashcards, there are a few other factors that might affect how efficiently you're taking in that information. One of them is how you're actually writing up those flashcards, the questions and the answers. Are you just taking up a whole massive paragraph, you're copying and pasting it in and then expecting to memorize that whole paragraph word for word? Or are you using uh, bullet points or are you refining the information that you're putting on there? Or are you thinking about how many bullet points you're actually putting as answers? There are different ways of writing up the flashcards which can then affect how well, or how quickly you can absorb that information. And then comes answering those questions on the flashcards or actively recalling that information. When you see that question, do you then just recall the information out loud to yourself or do you say it in your head or do you write it on an answer sheet? All of those things, I mean, I think people will be more or less receptive to any of those strategies. So then it's your job to make sure that any of those strategies that you're actually using actually works for you. So the way I used to measure progress, whether it be like doing online question bank or flashcards is two parameters. Number one, accuracy. Number two, time. So when I used to do this question bank called Pass Medicine, it gives you like a little percentage marker of how many questions you're getting right. And what I used to do is keep a close mental track on how that percentage is progressing. So uh, session one, it might be 60%. Then session five, it might go up to 67%. And then after two, three weeks, I might be getting in the 70s and 80s, yeah? If the percentage is static over, say, a three or four day period, or I'm doing worse, then it means that something is wrong here. In terms of time, this was more important for flashcards. So with flashcards, I would actually make sure that I can recall the information of the flashcard answers much quicker each time. So I might open a deck in day one, and it might take me like an hour and a half to go through all of those 30 or 40 questions. Then we might get to day 15 or day 20 of going through the deck, and it might only take 15 minutes or 10 minutes to recall every single point from that deck. And the key thing here is that because it's taken far less time to recall that information, those neurons in the brain are just getting stronger and stronger each time, which means that the information is sitting a lot harder in the brain. It's just getting stuck, yeah? That's a good thing. And now that we've talked a bit about measurement of progress, it kind of links in with personal development. And now that we mentioned personal development, that takes us on to the sponsor of today's video, which is Skillshare, which is this amazing kind of community and platform for learning new skills. And loads of creators make classes on there on a variety of topics from art and business and productivity and, uh, and, and language and graphic design, etc. so many topics. And I've used Skillshare for a very, very long time. In fact, you know, with all, some of those videos that I've made where, uh, actually, let me show you, yeah? You see this object moving from this side to this side, yeah? And then you see this popping up here and you see that popping up here. All of those animations I learned how to make from scratch. And guess how I learned how to make those from scratch? from Skillshare. So anytime I wanna learn something, the first thing I do is just go on Skillshare, try and search up that topic. In particular, when it comes to video editing and animation and graphic design and things like that, I just search on there, I find a class and I click on it and I watch it, I learn, then I apply it to my channel. And loads of you guys ask me all the time how I make those animations. Well, there you go. And the one class that I always recommend when I talk about Skillshare is one particular one by someone called Jake Bartlett and it talks about After Effects. And After Effects is the software that I use in conjunction with Premiere Pro in order to edit great videos. So he's got a few classes on there and one of them in particular talks about the speed graph. Yeah, you might not know about it, but the speed graph is something that you use in order to manipulate uh, 
at how quickly an object moves through the frame. So it might move slowly to begin with and then it moves faster and faster and then slow again, right? And uh, I mean, to me, that's just like aesthetically pleasing uh, when I get that speed kind of right and the motion and the blur and all of that. And aside from that, if you're interested in growing and building your own YouTube channel or your own platform, then I made a whole comprehensive class on how I built a meaningful channel or my channel. Uh, so hopefully there's a lot to learn from that as well. And you can find that by searching my name on Skillshare too. And so if you're interested in using Skillshare, then the first 1000 people or of my beloved subscribers to click the link in the description will get a free premium trial of Skillshare. So use that link in the description to get your free trial of Skillshare today. And then we get on to point number three, and this one's also the most important. <laughs> I've said every point is important, but this one's also important. And this is something uh, I used to do for a very, very long time, even when I didn't even know what it was. I used to do this when I was a lot younger and then the habit just kind of stuck with me. More recently, I've just been so busy that it hasn't been happening. But anyway, try use this. And essentially what I used to do or what I kind of do sometimes is every night before I go into bed, I try to form a mental movie or a mental video of the things that I'm trying to achieve and me getting to the finish line of it. So an example of when I was younger is uh, when I used to play a whole lot of sports, yeah? And if I had a football match the next day, then the night before I would play the match in real time in my head. It's almost like I'm watching it happen before it's even happened. And I'll see myself, okay, I'll have the ball, I'll be in the corner, I'll cut through a couple players, bam, bam, flip, flap, boom, cut past another player and then dash it in, send it into the top bins, right corner. And it's a goal, yeah? And I used to watch this just like over and over again. And to me, once I'd seen it and it was so real to me and it made me so focused, at making this a reality. And it would be the same thing for exams. So if I was studying for an exam two, three weeks ahead, then every night before I go to sleep, then I'll play that mental movie of me on the exam day, going into the hall, sitting down on the seat, opening the sheet, looking at the questions, me knowing all the answers of the questions, taking them, not being stressed, being confident, uh, and having like no doubts about whether I got the answer right or wrong. It was just like, yeah, I went in, banged it, came out, done. <laughs> yeah, so uh, so I used to play that over and over again. This might not be easy. I don't know if it makes sense when I'm explaining this right now, but it's actually a tool uh, that has been very useful for me for many, many years. Yeah, so try it out and see what you think. And now let's get on to point number four. And this one's also a mindset-based point, And it's to do with what should we call this? We'll talk, we'll call this stabilizing emotions or talking less in general. So one of the things I always try to do before exams is to get into flow, get into the zone, yeah? And the thing that used to kind of nudge me into it is to emotionally be the same pretty much every day, most of the time, at least when I'm working. And the thing that used to help me be kind of the same overall during the day is to spend less time just talking and wasting time. You know, as humans, we are uh, very emotional beings, yeah? And, and that tends to fluctuate throughout the day. So you wake up in the morning and then something goes wrong and then you feel a bit stressed and then something goes right and then you're happy and then you meet some friends and then you're having jokes and then, you go to a lecture and then you're sleepy and whatever, yeah? And I used to not like that happen so much, all right? And the other thing is that we're also affected by the vibe of people around us. So at least I am, and that's my personality type. So uh, like if I, if I walk into a room, I can instantly kind of uh, uh, not measure, but have an idea of what the vibe or what the energy in that room is. And so in order to avoid being too affected by what is happening all around and being more in control of uh, what's going on in my own mind and maintaining the focus and maintaining flow, and maintaining my 
presence in the zone, I would essentially just talk less, yeah? And people knew straight away that when I'm in that zone and I'm sitting on that desk, I have that like, that face, which is like, don't chat to me face, yeah? And then obviously I'm not saying like, sit down and be depressed in the corner all day long, yeah? What I'm saying is, there's a time and a place. And so what I used to do then is save all the jokes and the banter to either the start of the day or the end of the day or like lunchtime, yeah? So if we're going for lunch, then I switch up. Yeah, we're joking, we're chilling, we're bantering, everything. And then once that's out, then, you know, it's work time, so don't chat to me. <laughs> and then obviously do that for the rest of the day and then after work, then meet up with people and then we chat again, we chill, go to restaurants, eat, whatever. Yeah, but not mixing those together. I used to talk less. I didn't really work in groups too much. Uh, and I just sat on my desk with like emotionally, it was just like, and that's what it was. Like it felt like, you know what, I was in the zone. So I don't know if that one makes sense, but it will make sense for those who have a similar personality type to me, uh, that kind of somewhat introverted personality type and that's it so i hope you like that video if you like the video then like the video comment below what you thought uh, make sure you subscribe if you haven't subscribed already use the link in the description to get a free trial of premium skillshare membership and that's it smash your exams safe <laughs>